Thank you everyone who's, uh, who's joining us. Uh, we're just going to wait a minute or two just to allow everyone who is uh, who's registered just to come through and then we will start. Well, good, good afternoon, everybody. I can see uh, some more people are joining us. Um, but uh, thank you very much for joining our webinar this afternoon on technology and resilience. Uh, my name's Tim Figures, and I'm the Director of Technology, Sustainability and Innovation at Make UK. Uh, and I'm delighted to be joined by my colleagues, Charlotte, Nina and Chris, and two great Make UK members, um, Mike Haig Morgan and Will Bridgman. And what we're going to be doing over the next 90 minutes or so is talking about how technology uh, can help your manufacturing business be more resilient in a post COVID-19 world. The aims uh, for our session are uh, relatively uh, straightforward, I hope. Uh, we wanna talk a bit and explain the links that we've seen between uh, technology and resilience. We've got two Make UK members here from the Midlands and East who will be sharing best practice and how they've used technology um, over the last while to be more resilient. We'd like to tell you a little bit more about Make UK's Make It Smart campaign and the various things we're doing of which this and two other similar events are part. And hopefully you'll be uh, inspired to take some action on the basis of what you hear today, um, but we'll also be signposting some um, sources of help and support, which can help you as you go through your digital journey. Just like to point out that the session is being recorded, uh, so we will distribute this on YouTube later so it can be shared with people who uh, weren't actually able to join the session today. Now, uh, in a minute, I'll give a short introduction and then I'll invite Mike and Will to uh, speak and explain their experiences. But just a couple of housekeeping points, because there are quite a lot of people on the call and we're doing this in webinar format. Please could you submit your questions using the question and answer box. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should find a little button marked Q&A. If you click that, then a box will pop up in which you can uh, put in your questions. You can put in a question at any time during the session um, when any of the uh, panelists is speaking. And also if you see a question that somebody else has asked that you like, you can um, upvote it by clicking on the thumbs up symbol just like you might in a Facebook post. And then the questions with the most likes will move to the top of the list. So we know the ones that you would like us to, to answer first. So please uh, don't be shy, um, put in your questions um, at any time during the session. And then once Mike and Will have had a chance to talk about their experiences, uh, we, will then, um, we will then get to the questions and hopefully we will be able to uh, answer them. Uh, we will also be sending around some information um, after the session, just summarising the points we've talked about today and providing some follow up information about uh, about next steps. So don't worry if you can't note everything down as we're going through uh, things, uh, there'll be the opportunity to see the information summarised and sent through to your email boxes uh, a day or two uh, after the meeting happens.
So hopefully uh, that's all clear. Uh, and in particular, we want to try to make this session as interactive as possible. So please don't forget to um, put in your questions using the question and answer box and we'll get around to those in, a, in about 20 minutes time. Um, and then we will be finished uh, promptly by 3.30. So um, one of the th uh, four priority things that Make UK is focusing on this year is our Make It Smart campaign, uh, which this is one of the um, uh, this is one of the uh, parts of. Um, and the reason we are doing that is we want to really focus on how our members and how manufacturing as a whole can improve not only productivity and quality and both Mike and Will have, have used uh, technology in their business to do that, but also increasingly resilience. As I'll say in a minute, the current crisis has really um, put resilience of manufacturing, of supply chains, of customers, uh, of employees and of workplaces very much to the fore. And we believe that uh, technology has got an important role to play in helping all of us do that in our own businesses and in our own workplaces. So there are three elements to our campaign. First, uh, we did a lot of work, and I know some of you participated in that, thank you very much, on how we might improve regional support networks and services to help manufacturers who want to go down the digital journey. Um, we produced a policy paper, that's a, a picture of it on the right-hand side of your screen, about a month ago with 15 recommendations for things that the government local bodies and manufacturing as a sector should do um, together in uh, in order to, to make that happen. So if you are interested, particularly if maybe you're a body that's giving advice, um, please do have a look at that paper. I hope it will be helpful. Secondly, we're holding a number of best practice events like this one today. And thirdly, we're very keen to update our evidence base so that we've got the best possible information about how our sector is digitalizing and how it is um, responding to the COVID pandemic. So we will circulate details of this later on in the session and afterwards, but we do currently have an innovation monitor survey um, in partnership with Infor, which is open. And if you would like to uh, fill that out and give us your views, on how digitalization and, and on how technology is affecting you, we would really, really love to hear from you. Uh, it'll take about 20 minutes to fill out and details will um, come along uh, later. So thank you very much for that and uh, thanks for your support. The more information we have from you, the more we can tailor our work and our campaigns to make sure they are delivering what works for you. So, like to make it a little bit uh, interactive and so before we go to uh, before we go to our panelists just be grateful for your thoughts on how you see technology and resilience working before we've had a chance to talk about it so hopefully you can see on your screen now two questions uh, the first one uh, yes, no one. Do you think that digital manufacturers are more resilient than non-digital ones? And then secondly, uh, which technologies uh, do you think can make the greatest contribution to improving resilience? So if you could just have a look at that and give us your thoughts, then that would be really good just as a, just as a baseline uh, for the session. Now, um, there are five main industrial digital technologies uh, that we tend to talk about. Um, we share those with the with those defined by the, the Made Smarter initiative, um, which are the first five in that list. And then we've added on um, back office systems, because while those aren't specifically manufacturing technologies, they're things that every manufacturer needs and where resilience, of course, is also is also really important. So if you haven't voted, then perhaps you could do so in the next 15 seconds or so, and then I will close the poll and share the results. It's very interesting to see, to see how they're coming in. So 
few more votes just coming in. Okay. Uh, additive manufacturing means 3D printing, Stephen. Um, additive manufacturing commonly known as, as 3D printing. Okay, well that looks like everybody who wants to uh, vote has done so. So I'm going to close the poll and then share the results with you all. There we go. Well, that's very interesting. So an overwhelming majority, 81% of you uh, who voted said you felt that digital manufacturers are more resilient than non-digital ones. Won't surprise you uh, to hear that uh, we and our, our panelists would agree with that. Uh, be interesting, the 19% um, of people who disagreed with that statement actually, um, whether we might change your mind during the course of the session. And then, um, very interesting, uh, you're able to select more than one of these uh, technologies. Um, it's interesting um, there. Actually, and I'll come on to that, additive manufacturing 3D printing has uh, really is, is actually one of the most interesting contributors to, to resilience. But uh, good to see a lot of you putting an emphasis on things like back office systems and robotics and cobotics. So thank you for that. Um, Nina, have we got the results of that down? Great, thank you. So what what has the current COVID uh, crisis taught us? Um, well, what I think, first of all, it's really taught us is that when a crisis hits, technology does allow uh, us to be flexible, responsive mm. um, and resilient. Um, and the uh, the really interesting example that we've seen uh, over the last few months has been the um, UK ventilator challenge. So when uh, we needed uh, ventilators for the NHS and when um, our normal routes for procuring those weren't available, uh, a number of different consortia uh, were set up in response to the government's request to try to deliver this in the UK. And actually, um, they came across a number of practical and logistical issues. How could they actually design um, a ventilator when uh, the design teams were all working at home and couldn't gather together in the same place? Um, and then when they tried to manufacture them, how could they uh, get hold of crucial components that normally come from China and were not available because of supply chain disruptions? And actually, technology helped um, solve both of those problems. They used AR and VR technology to help collaborative design with everybody working from their homes rather than all together in a, in a factory to build a digital prototype. And then when components couldn't be found, they turned to 3D printing, additive manufacturing uh, in order to uh, print components or tools for making components that they couldn't, uh, they couldn't get. From China. So there's two very recent examples of how two of our five IDTs have been used to improve resilience and ensure both as a sector but as a nation we were able to make critical products at a time of crisis. And it's you know a step from that to say that when travel is difficult or when you can't uh, people can't come to factories or when they're ill or when they're shielding or when they are looking after loved ones who are ill, things like remote monitoring, working and collaboration tools can um, keep you going um, without people having to be physically present in the same place at the same time. If you've got online back office functions and also crucially online sales functions, uh, then you don't need shops to be open to sell your products or sales people um, to uh, sales people to uh, travel to customers in order to sell. There are ways you can do that online, including maybe using virtual reality to simulate what your products would look or feel like in a particular, in a, in a particular environment. And as we're all uh, moving to introduce socially distant workplaces and get back to work in a COVID secure way, tech doesn't need to socially distance. 
So deploying um, technologies like robotics, for example, um, might uh, enable you to keep up production levels while maintaining um, production lines with the right degree of separation between um, employees. So there are just um, five, uh, four things to think about as we go into the session that I think uh, we've learned and that we've picked up from our members and from government and from our experience uh, over the uh, last few months. But that's enough from me. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my slides now um, and invite our speakers to... Um, all right. I'm sorry. I hope uh, one or two people saying my sound was breaking up. I hope I'm hope I'm back now, uh, and you can hear me okay. Um, uh, I'm going to now pass over to our two panelists to talk to you, and then we will come forward for the questions. So please do keep the questions coming, and uh, we will answer them um, in a little while. So first, could I pass over to Mike Haig Morgan, uh, co owner of Autocraft Drivetrain Solutions and Mike will explain a bit about his digital journey and how digital tech has helped him to be resilient during the crisis. Mike, over to you. Thank you very much, Tim. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, if I just go and start to share my screen. Okay. Can we see that, Tim? Great. So uh, we're going to talk today about digital, uh, our journey with digital. The fact that it's resilient was, a, was uh, not the intention when we went on this. We went on it for many other good reasons. It's been a very pleasant uh, result, uh, the resilience of, of what we've done. So I'll, I'll just take you through this. I'm going to go through the slides pretty quickly. Uh, because I really want to have people have the opportunity to ask questions. One slide on Autocraft first, for those who don't know us, uh, we're now a group headquartered in Grantham. We do have three businesses in the UK. Uh, we're solely in the UK uh, and the original one in Grantham has now grown significantly since we bought it in 2010. Uh, now just over 200 people uh, and we turned that business and that's growing nicely. And this presentation, most of the digital you see in here is about that facility because it's the main facility. The other two facilities do machining, whereas Grantham is mainly engine building, uh, remanufacturing of engines for the customers that you can see down uh, on the bottom right of your screen. The theme here of what we do is we buy businesses, traditional engineering businesses, and we turn them around. Uh, these have been businesses that have failed in the past, and clearly something has to be different if you're going to turn a business around and digital is one of the main reasons that we're able to do that. Uh, and I think it's very important, the fact that we are such a traditional business. I think if you can make digital work so powerfully in a business like ours, then you've got a great chance of it working in any manufacturing business, no, ma no matter what you do. So questions really are, how have we done it? Which I'll go through and then how have we and why have we been more resilient? Uh, during this period. So like anybody, we have a good business plan. We plan in five year cycles uh, and a vision of what we wanted to be and what we wanted to do. We identified a strategic project that you see at the bottom. We call those the pillars, the foundations of our business would be around digital. And that's been in there since we did our business plan in late 2014, that was Vision 2020, uh, to, to give us the growth uh, and we would be the foundation of, of a lot of what we were doing. So we call it our magic wand. Uh, what I'm going to take you through is our journey. That's just one of the main projects in each year. So what you'll see is the trend that we started with something very simple and it gradually grew and became more complex. I'm not going to take you through every one of those projects. I'm just going to give you a real flavour so that we can talk more about it uh, later on. So at the start of the journey, really low cost. This is how we made our engines on the left-hand side. And the, you can see the typical process sheets. Everything was handwritten documentation, significant room for error in transcribing from one document to another, a serial number or a part number. So a very manual process indeed. 
first part of the project was really simple. We used some digital scanners to actually start to record what we were doing, just handheld scanners. These are the type of scanners that we're all familiar with these days with uh, drop off of parcels at our houses. I actually came across this when I was delivering a hire car back. And uh, what I found was I was on the phone to a customer that received an engine from us who was not happy with the quality and was uh, saying it was our fault. And I had no way of proving it. And as I was, I was on the phone call, I was simultaneously checking a car at an airport. And when I was on the phone, they were able to check me in. They knew my name, they knew where I'd been with the car, they had the contract and had pictures of the car before I picked it up so that they could see that I'd returned it in good order. So it had process sheets on the scanner and it was taking data. Within three or four weeks, we had this completely up and running and all of our engines are now checked. Uh, and that's been a big step forward in making sure that if we have had a problem, we know we've had it uh, and defending ourselves when it's not our issue. Uh, it gave us a real taste for what you can do. It's very simple, but low cost. It saved us a lot of money very quickly. Just one year later, we then started to build engines, as you can see here. We introduced DC tooling. And within those DC tools that you can see hanging from the spindles, you'll see the computer screen and the touch screen on the right, uh, on the left, sorry. Uh, there's a, all of that data is tracked behind into the network points and stored on a central database within our company. So this is now checking every torque that has been done in the right sequence, every bolt in the right sequence, um, by, by fixturing and making sure that it's, uh, it records with the encoders that you're doing the right bolt. We'll see later how we've taken it to the next level. But for us, this was a massive, massive step forward. Uh, at, so, and one year, just one year after we just started to use scanners. So quite a big case of change. Next year, we decided to be a bit more ambitious. And you can see the frame here is actually made uh, in our maintenance bay. So we bought a robot, we bought a camera from eBuyer and one of our graduates has taken some off the, self shots, off the shelf software and made AI, our first piece of AI. So this robot, you don't have to apply sealant by hand anymore. The robot applies the sealant and it applies it to multiple parts. It knows because of the camera, which part it is. So it knows which program to select just by looking at the part. And it does all of this whilst the operator can do something else. So it's a quality and a productivity win. But critically, it also uh, then at the end of the process, it measures the bead of uh, sealant that's been applied, whether it's in or out of spec, photographs it back to the same database that the tools the previous year went on to. So you can see how we've got individual pieces of technology now that we are starting to integrate into a more manufacturing system. Our biggest breakthrough came from an Innovate UK workshop that I attended. For those of you that haven't used Innovate UK, uh, KTN, it's a fantastic way of really getting to understand technology and getting some help. What was explained to me was Moore's Law and how technology over the next few years was going to really drop in price. So I had a couple of charts. One chart that they showed me uh, was around the number of megapixels and how megapixels will become cheaper. And then the second was about how you can process it, so computer power. And they showed me with my own, my own mobile phone how powerful that was today and how cheap it was in the next year or so. That gave us the idea to start using cameras. So we now project down in work instructions. So the work instructions aren't even on the touch screen. There's a touch screen as a backup, but it, the, you don't have time. It projects down and that projector that you'll see in the middle highlights what you need to do next with visual instructions and color codes. And the cameras that you can see on either side so show you, uh, sh uh, record what the operator is doing. And if the operator has put their hand in the wrong place in the wrong sequence, it'll automatically stop. And it collects all of the data from the tools and everything that the operator does to make sure that everything's done in the right sequence. Here's some examples. So there is still a touch screen for reference, and that's the process sheets that, were not, that used to be years ago in paper or digital. 
And then you can see it actually saying, these are the bolts you should tighten. These are the parts that you should pick. So it's very intuitive. Once you learn the system, you can, you can follow the process. It's very easy. What we did late in 2019, fortunately, just before we went into uh, COVID and the start of 2020, we just got this up and running, was a cloud database. So we stopped recording the data internally. We record it on a cloud. You can see there the operator, the, amount, the, every, the number of seconds, every single operation is recorded to give what we call full engine DNA. And on the next slide, you can see if there is a fault, it won't progress because it switches everything off on the tool. So you cannot do anything else without either rectifying it yourself and it checks that you've rectified it. Or if it's more serious, it calls a quality supervisor and you have to stop and, and have it reworked by a special rework process under supervision. So this is all getting now collected into the cloud and shared with our customer. So on the resilience part of what we've done, we have been more resilient than most. We've been able to remanufacture components as well. So as well as our having the digital resilience, we have the ability to remanufacture a part. We found there are a lot of parts that were nice and cheap parts from China initially where that we were buying. But when we couldn't get them, we could still remanufacture and that kept our lines going. So that's another part of our resilience. But certainly our digital capability was really important because we've seen big switches in demand and availability of parts. We've been able to react more quickly, changing the lines over. We even managed to launch a new project for Jaguar Land Rover, 90 engines a week, completely on target and on time, despite the lockdown. So a couple of slides, not many other slides to go now, but just to just try and summarize two of the main things that we've said on resilience. So in changing from when, one engine to another, before it was digital, we had over a thousand written work instructions. You had to train employees in just one or two engine families. So they weren't very, as flexible as you'd like them to be. Now, it doesn't take six months to train somebody. You just train somebody in the system it's an, and the system guides you through it. So an operator now can work five, six, seven different types of engine lines so long as we've got that capability of the cameras and the process to guide them through. Another thing is we used to have dedicated fixtures and tooling for everything and you have to have to switch over on the lines, the tooling. So the line would have to be down for a matter of hours as you switch all of the, all of the fixtures in to, to build quality into physical poker yokes. Well, now our cameras and our poker yokes, the camera sees everything. You show it what it is, it knows you're changing over, it has artificial intelligence. So if we had parts or we had a problem during COVID and we quickly had to change something, the changes, changeovers happen either completely simultaneous, uh, simultaneously or uh, very, very quickly. That's just two of the benefits, that, the main benefits that we have seen. Another element was the actual approval. So we've I said we've launched this program for JLR. Before digital, JLR used to have to come on site. They had to sign everything off with PPAP. Those who are in automotive will understand what I'm on about. This is where you have to physically do run, run a rate and the kind of customer comes in as a view of your processes. Because we could give the customer access to the cameras, the customer could see what was going on. They also had the database in the cloud, seeing that we were doing what we were doing and it was recording it correctly and it could be reworked and the customer signed off the entire program, a major engine program online from their own homes, which was a massive step forward for us. Uh, we, we would have been in serious trouble if we hadn't launched that program on time. So, a bit about COVID. Uh, we all know that whenever the world faces a crisis, it results in a shift, a uh, step change in technology. We've seen before engineering and tech manufacturing usually lead the way, particularly uh, not so much in the financial crisis, but other crises we, we've had, we often find that we've, it fast tracks our capability. Uh, clearly COVID-19 is gonna change the world forever. Manufacturing needs to quickly embrace the good things that we've seen and learned. I think it's, it's clear that um, digital needs to be a priority for the UK. And that's why I was so pleased when Charlotte and Tim invited me to do this today to, 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 to spread the word. Wider on digital manufacturing, just it's not as scary as you think. It's much cheaper than you'll believe when you get into it. 
it will give you quick wins. It isn't easy to do a capex and define all of it. It does take a little bit of a leap in faith for you, but there's a lot of help out there to guide you through, make UK a uh, consigned process, as Tim said. So my message is, why not go out and try a small project for yourself? I've had uh, people take this on before, and whenever they have, uh, they've always seen great success. Lots of low cost things. Uh, there's a copy of this that you, that you can get later, so I won't go through it all. But what well, I think the most important thing is to start a journey and create a culture of, inno of innovation. If you get a bit of traction, it just self perpetuates because you get win after win. Finally, it can transform the landscape. It's ideally suited to SMEs, in my opinion, because it's a lot easier than people realize. Uh, and I think it won't be long before, if you, once you've tried it, you'll be a bit of a digital disciple like me and you'll be telling others to do it. So I've kept it brief. I'm really looking forward to some questions uh, to follow a bit later. <coughs> Thank you very much, Mike. That's that's great, and um, it's it's really good. To, it's definitely been a journey for you, hasn't it? And perhaps we can talk a bit about that when we when we get to the questions. Uh, and I think uh, for for a lot of members that we speak to, you started with something and then you built on it as you saw the incremental benefits that that, that you could you could get. So good to see some questions coming in in the Q and A box. Please do keep them coming in as as uh, Will speaks and then um, after the next presentation we will come back and we will we will um, respond to them all. Mike maybe you could just stop sharing your screen now if that's okay and then uh, we will go over to Will. So thanks Mike. Will Bridgman, uh, Chairman of Warren Services, another great digital champion and Make UK member. Will, can I pass over to you to explain about your digital journey and how Warren Services has been using tech to improve its resilience? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Will Bridgman, Chairman of Warren Services. Um, those that know me know I'm not a great one for slides, so there's no slides for me. But um, if you... The ones that don't know about Warren Services, Warren Services is a 30-year-old family engineering business started by my mother and father in our garage. Um, we were subcontract machinists and we've transitioned over the last 30 years into a, what I call a full service business. So we do CNC machining, we do laser cutting, we do high pressure water cutting, we do welding, we do painting and shop blasting and electromechanical assembly. So we make high-level sub-assemblies and machines for people around the world. Our client base are the global theatre industry, so that's an industry that's been hit quite hard in the last few months. So we make uh, winches for flying people and scenery. We also do a bit in the pharmaceutical sector, making pill coating machines. We also supply all the charging infrastructure to a large online grocery retailer, um, which we can't say their name, but they're... Uh, a, yeah, a big, big player in that market and now globally. Um, we also do quite a lot in offsite construction. So we make balcony systems for high rise buildings within the UK and help with development of that for the global market. And also more recently, um, electric vehicle charging. Um, and I think the funniest thing is I turned my computer around so the light was better and I'm looking out of my office window and I was thinking, what I was going to say about, you know, make sure you get robots to do the right job and how that helps with resilience is I'm watching my robot lawnmower slowly mow across the lawn. And I think the reason we bought that lawnmower was my, the guy that normally does my gardening is a, is a nurse. So during COVID, he wasn't doing any gardening. He was obviously quite busy doing his nursing. So we bought a robot lawnmower. So now He's come back because they're not so busy. The robot can still mow the grass. And he actually said, I'm quite pleased because your gardens, there's a lot of grass. And now I can do the borders and the trees and the stuff like that. So, you know, initially my wife was like, oh, the gardener's here and the robot lawnmower's mowing the lawn doing his job. What's he going to say? But it was, it, it was cool. And he was actually, after he got his head around, he said, isn't it a bit creepy? Keep crawling around. And my wife was like, no, it's quite good. So that's a bit of an aside. Not it's not solely relevant but um warren services is different from mike's business in the way that we don't know what we're going to make day for day to day so we have to be we've always had to be super agile 
But um, I see a lot of the benefits, not just in the, in the factory, but in the back office, like Tim alluded to. So it's sometimes a lot easier to automate back office functions and communication functions. And it is actually, you know, we are deploying cobots within the factory, but it's easier and cheaper to make the data flows better. So one of the things that's benefited Warren massively is our adoption of browser-based technology. So way before COVID, we were an Office 365 user. So that means for people, you know, we don't have a mail server on site. All our mail is off site. So anyone could log in anywhere from anywhere in the world and get their email. Um, so so that, that was beneficial because that infrastructure was there. We were already using Teams. For those that don't, well, most people know what Teams, if they're on a Zoom call, it's very similar to Zoom. But it's part of that Microsoft Office 365 platform that's just part of the package for like five pound a month. So very, very cheap. Um, we were already embraced SharePoint, which was part of Office 365, which meant all of our files were stored in the cloud. So basically what that meant is when COVID struck, and we very, very quickly decided pre the government really saying anything that we should start deploying office based people or engineering people that weren't needed in the factory into their homes. People already knew roughly what they needed to do. Don't get me wrong. Didn't work seamlessly from day one. We obviously we had a lot more people and people had used it a bit, you know, at the weekend or when they were abroad working, but we had to, do that but it happened very very quickly and it and it meant we could continue working and and we're very very lucky but very proud to also say that we've we've furloughed no people we've continued working throughout that's not just down to our digital it's down to us being an agile business and a bit of luck you know i'm not saying you know it was all our great ideas but being able to deploy those people out of the business and them to work efficiently made it a lot easier for us to keep going especially in the early days when things were all thrown up in the air and people were frightened and people were concerned it, it was one thing we didn't need to worry about um i would echo what mike said is at warren services we made a few mistakes we've probably bitten off projects that were maybe too grandiose too difficult to do and what we've realized now is we should do everything in an agile manner and agile and minimum viable product they're the two words we repeat continuously and what that means is make something cheap get it to the people that are going to use it and ask for their feedback so a really simple example we we've been collecting shop floor data via touch screens for the last 15 years you know that's not that's not new but that was okay if you were booking on one job at a time but lots of our operators run multiple machines in a time frame so they'd be running three machines they can't Put that in through the touch screen so we had a, a manual timesheet was basically a piece of paper that those operators would fill out what they did and once every morning neil um one of our guys in the office would go around the two factories collect those sheets um and enter that data into the system a he had to walk around both sites that wasn't great but and then with covid that was even more of a problem um, and then he couldn't read what they'd written on the sheet because their handwriting was poor. Um, and then he had to manually enter that data into the system. So, so what we did was rather than try and do something super complicated, we replicated that simple form in the cloud in our system. So someone could just log in, fill the information in. So straight away, within a week, Neil didn't have to collect the data in those forms and he could read all the data, which was great, saved him loads of time. But then he fed back to me to say, well, people are still writing down job numbers of jobs that are marked complete. So we got the software changed so they could only write down numbers of live jobs. And then he said, well, people are booking on the operations that don't exist. So then we modified the system. And what I'm trying to say here is we got something out, minimal viable product. It was, it was okay. And then we iterated on that with feedback from the person who was actually using the system. I'm not the person, you know, I, I could sit and go, yeah, I'm the chairman of Warren Services. I know everything, you know, you must do it like this. And that always goes wrong and you get no buy-in. But by giving the guys the basic tool and then letting them iterate on the product, especially as they saw developments weekly, they were like, oh, could we do this? Could we do that? And all of a sudden these 
these barriers to digitization in the factory had started to be broken down. Um, we've, we've also kept the projects, so we've tried to keep everyone happy. So we've done lots of little projects for different aspects of the factory. Now, another incident was what, what Mike was talking about was a quality inspection. You know, this is very relevant with COVID. We were using paper-based quality inspection documents similar to um, Autocraft. So when it was going through the turn-in operations, they were filling out the, the, the measurement data. And then when it moved to milling, they were filling in their measurement data. But then the paper has to flow. You're transferring that information, but also, you know, the possible transmission of, you know, any sort of bacteria with that. So we created a simple form online where the operators could fill out their inspection measurements on that document, but multiple people could enter the information all in one go. So while op one was turning, op two could be milling and the data would be all aligned in the right place. And we've not got oil on the inspection documents and our customers can log in and look at that stuff. But also we could then quickly add checks into that. So if they wrote the wrong dimension in, it would tell them that it was the wrong dimension. And then the next iteration, it told them it was the wrong dimension and asked them if they could rework it and then also sent that information to the quality department so they could investigate. Um, we've also now rolled out, um, we were collecting our clocking data, i.e. the, the um, employees clocking into the factory through our ERP system. But it wasn't very flexible. It definitely couldn't deal with remote workers. So we've rolled that into our Warren web platform, which hosts um, this quality system, our task system, um, lots of different things. So now all of our home workers can clock in through this cloud portal from home. Um, so we're not having to send emails to get them booked onto the system because they're remote working. Also, later this month, we will roll out um, online holiday booking. So our employees will be able to book their holiday from home. It will go for a number of checks to make sure that their, you know, their manager isn't on holiday or one of their co-workers isn't off. And if it, if it sees that there's a, a match and it's allowed, it will automatically allow them to book their holiday remotely so they don't have to come into work. It's a better experience for the employee because they don't have to think, oh, I want this week off for coming to work. Then they tell me I can't have that week. Then I've got to upset my wife or husband because we've got to now look at a different holiday. They can do it all from home. Um, but also with, with the COVID situation, we could, it meant we weren't having to come into the office so regularly. You know, that communication flow is becoming more and more digital. Um, I think it's also very, very important with all of these things is to do things that are cheap. Like I said before, choose something that's small, changing to Office 365, putting some documents in the cloud. You know, that's relatively low cost. It's relatively easy to do. You know, don't let someone try and sell you a massive system that's going to take a year to implement and solve all of your problems all in one go because it will fail. Well, you, it might succeed, but I think the theory, you know, the data says about nine in 10 of those type of projects either run massively over budget, massively over time, or never happen at all. Um, and I think, you know, start with, if you're, if you're not in this digital world, start with something simple, maybe use a Google Sheet, share some data, you know, in a, in a Google platform that's free. You know, you can try it out and then you say, well, that doesn't do exactly what I want. Then you can maybe get someone in to help you build it more customized around exactly what you want. And I, again, echo um, Mike's experiences are the thing that's really helped us with digital transformation and resilience is our apprenticeships, our apprentices. You know, anyone that knows me or my father is, you know, we are apprenticeships through and through, you know, having those young people in the business to help deploy these digital skills has been, you, you know, I can't, I don't know how we would have done it without them. But also we've been, we've brought people in. So we've used, we work quite a lot with Autodesk with digital design tools. Um, we use their digital catalyst program to bring in um, someone from university to look at specific digital projects. And actually it ended up much bigger than that. And he actually ended up staying for over a year. And now he's back at university um, he was involved in helping deploy cobots, helping employ sensor technology on the machines. And actually, he's just finished his 
degree and he's actually coming back to not work for Warren Services but to work for a, a spin out digital company that we've formed that he's going to lead as a um, 22 year old new graduate. Um, one of the, th the other thing that's really helped us, and I'll keep this quite brief, is our shop floor data collection on directly from machines. So we were, we've always collected some data from the machinery in the factory, like, like CNC milling machines or lathes or welding plants, to see what they were doing when they were operating, when they weren't. We were using a, a German product called Verma, which monitors the light stacks. It was fine. It gave us, oh, this machine has operated for 10 hours today and it worked for 15 hours yesterday, but there was no context to that information. It wasn't linked to our ERP. It was good. So if my guys on the shop floor said, oh, we need a new machine, boss. I'm like, well, that machine's only been running for five hours today, so why don't we use that one more before I buy another £200,000 machine? But we wanted a bit more data. So we actually bumped into someone for another meeting where we were making deployable buildings for our, um, a, one of our customers. And, and I discovered that he'd, made, he'd designed a um, Wi-Fi leak sensor for the um, home insurance market, and he just sold that business to Hive Home Automation for 15 million. And I said, well, could I use that similar technology for monitoring what my machines are doing? So he said, yes. So we worked together. So we built our own hardware with a company down the road. And now we've got our own sensor platform that monitors our machines, just whether they're on or off, whether the door is open. We send that information to the cloud, um, which then allows us to visualize that information. And now we're merging that with our ERP data and the data from the Warren Web. And we're starting to get real lots of value from that. And it's, it's about doubly using or triply using the data. Once you start to collect a few things digitally, each one is valuable in its own right. The inspection documentation is very valuable to, to us in the company, but also to our customer. But actually, now we can see when the first off inspection is completed digitally, we can merge that with when the operator booked onto that job. So we now know how long the setup time was. Because getting the operator to try and book setup time, you know, can be quite difficult sometimes. Like, I, just, oh, I just want to get on with my job. But now we've got sensor data coming in, we've got inspection data coming in, we're, we're starting to put that stuff together. And I think very much like Mike, the, the sky's the limit. You know, once you start stitching these bits of information that can you can gather quite cheaply and, you know, you can buy handheld scanners from eBay second hand for 15 quid, you know, the, the basis of everything we've done is deploying a 4K low power computer at every single workstation. So that be that a, a lathe, be that a mill, be that a welding station, be that a paint plant, be that an assembly bench. And that's then allowed us to deploy all these different digital tools. So viewing drawings, viewing models, collecting time, filling in inspection data. So I think, you know, I'll wrap it up now, but just say this doesn't need to cost a lot. Get someone young who's keen that wants to do this. Keep the workforce on board. Shape the development around problems in the business and make people their own custom solutions that makes them feel bought into this. So yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Will. Thank you very much for talking to us um, about your journey. Now the questions are coming in, but please, uh, please do keep them coming. You can see um, uh, how to how to enter them, and thanks thanks for your votes. Um, uh, I, perhaps we can just uh, start with the questions we've got, and uh, if any more uh, occur to anyone while we while we are talking, then please do add them in because we've uh, we've got about uh, 20, 25 minutes um, to to deal with your questions. So um, <clears throat> the first one, and we're going to do these in um, in order of popularity so if you've if you found the little thumbs up buttons uh some people have and if there are questions you'd like us to answer quickly click click on those and they'll come to the top of the list so the first question which i think was one for you mike but maybe maybe will uh, you'd like to answer it as well but perhaps go to you mike first from mark adams who asks which erp system are you using to join all of this cleverness together we keep well away from the erp system <laughs> don't go near it <laughs> don't go near it uh we got a very old system at some point it would we keep 
we keep looking to update our ERP. We keep getting quoted half a million, million pound plus for all these amazing, clever systems that you can sit in your office and control the world from there and never have to talk to anybody. That's not the way we run our business. I see there's a question about lean manufacturing from Dan uh, about, about um, that element of uh, being interactive with people. Um, we still report everything on the hour, every hour, as a team, what you do, what's good, what's bad. So we've kept the best of the old, of the lean principles. We've added in the digital element and left the ERP system well alone. That does mean you have to write your own database. There's so many low cost packages out there for, for databases where we just get a CSV file from all these different bits of technology. It's quite easy to stitch it all together. Is that the same for you, Will? Are you, are you going anywhere near ERP systems or can you manage quite happily without them? No, we've, we've had an ERP system when we were a very, very small company. We've, all, you know, we've been on this digital journey for 20 plus years. This is not, this is not new to us, you know, like our apprenticeship journey. It's, it, it's baked within Warren Services, but we've had the same ERP provider, but we really do probably need a different ERP, but we're using we bolt our tools around it. So we use a web tool to take data out of our ERP and then we merge our other stuff in with it. So we've created our tools outside of our ERP. I think that's the key. It's about making little tools and stitching them together, not trying to buy one big system. You know, our, we've got a few problems with our ERP at the moment, but yeah, it's, it's, it's the last thing we change. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great responses. Um, now, there's a really, really important question from Neil Smith next with uh, five votes. And this is something that we've certainly thought about an awful lot uh, at, at Make UK. And Neil asks, uh, did you find any cultural resistance to the digital initiatives? Mike, what, how did people react uh, when you... Um, when you came in and said, right, we want to, we want to, um, you know, introduce all we, these new systems. We had the, we had the benefit that the previous uh, ownership of the company had taken it from over 20 million down to seven and bankrupt. So we, we, <laughs> we had the, the benefit of the fact that we need to do something different. Uh, more of the same, more of what's been around isn't going to work. We're very hands-on. We, uh, we were the management team that were working for the bosses that we disagreed with their strategy. So it was easier coming from it because we were not one of them, but we're all much more of a team and it's a fantastic culture that we do have in the business. So I think it was a lot easier at Autocraft than it would be elsewhere. I think you need to be very mindful of the fact that you've got information that can go against people and you've got to turn a blind eye to some of it because the benefits of what you get are bigger than the nitpicking that you can get by looking at the camera uh, and catching them out for doing something relatively small wrong. Um, that doesn't build trust. So you've got to use it very carefully. And we, we found that, that the camera side of it and people being watched, we found that not to be a problem because of the way we've approached it. And, and what about you, Will? Um, did you experience any resistance when you started going down this road? Yeah, loads. Um, we're a 30 year old business and I know some of the men that work in the business since I was, you know, a boy when I started working for my father when I was seven at a previous business. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, it's, it's, and, and we've been a business that's grown over the last 30 years and everyone's had a job and we've got bigger and we've done more things. So we didn't have the advantage of it being in a bad place and being able to go, we've got to do all this. So it's been about slowly getting people on board and picking like champions within different areas and training them. You can't train everyone and then getting them to impart over a longer period of time, you know, the benefits and then trying to solve people's problems, you know, make it easy for them so that it makes their life easier, not harder. And, 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 and be willing to change the system to suit the people. As long as it fits in with the overarching plan, you know, you can't, you can't deviate from the plan, but if, them having it red rather than green makes it easy for them. Give it to them in red, even if it doesn't make any sense to you whatsoever. If it makes sense to them and it gets them on board and it's cheap to do, you know, take, try and tailor it around them and don't, 
we've done a lot of training more recently to make sure we're fully exploiting Microsoft Teams. But the training isn't around, you must do it like this. Your team must do this. You must report in this way. You must do that. It's about showing the leaders within those departments and their, their staff that these are the tools. Now see how you can use them to best make your life easier. You're both co-owners of your respective businesses. Did, did, did that help um, in introducing this? Would you have been able to op do what you wanted or operate in, in such a way if you, weren't, uh, if you weren't the owner of the business, if you were kind of working for, for investors or, or, it, or, a, or a multinational group or something? It, it makes it a lot easier when it's your money because Correct. sometimes you can't, there's not always an ROI on everything initially. When you look back, you're like, why didn't we do that five years ago? Because it saved us so much money. But if you looked at, oh, what, how much is this going to cost and how are we going to get this back? And our, the IT company we work with that helps us write some of our software, every project we do, part of the project kickoff meeting is, how is this going to benefit Warren Services as a customer? And sometimes it's, they're like, how, you know, this isn't going to have a specific ROI, but it's part of a piece of jigsaw that then makes the ROI. So I think being an owner makes that a lot easier. But still, I've got to justify all this expenditure to my mum. So um, <laughs> that's worse than any PLC board. You know, she won't invite me around for Sunday lunch anymore. I mean, Mike, you, you, you uh, put your own money on the line. And in fact, I yeah. think your mum's money, if I remember. Yeah, it was my mum's money. Uh, it was a <laughs> teacher's pension, £67,500, yeah. yeah. I remember um, it well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but you'd put your own money on the line to save a business that was failing. Again, did, did your employees kind of respect you for that and kind of give you the benefit yes. of the doubt? Yeah, you do, you do get a lot more benefit for the doubt. But the... the, the ability to just have a punt because you've got that entrepreneurial spirit and you don't have anybody else to answer to is a big benefit if you're going to try and develop new technology where trying to do a typical payback calculation is really tough and what you'll find is you'll just do a couple of projects they'll pay back way quicker than you ever thought and then you'll just do the next one and just keep reinvesting that money and you just you'll just take off well, um, thank you. I mean, I think that is that that is that is very interesting. And perhaps we might come back a bit later to kind of finance and how that links into all of this because it's often often raised as an issue. Um, Mike, uh, we have a question specifically you from uh, Mike Ayres next, which was a, but I mean, Will, please do feel 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 free to chip in as well. And um, did you need to recruit people with specialist skills? I let's take that as skills you didn't have in the business uh, already uh, when you began the journey. We had almost no digital skills uh, when, we, when we took over the business, left in the business. Uh, it had had years and years of redundancy and anybody with the, the more modern skills had been snapped up first and, and, had, and, had, and had left, frankly. Uh, but we did have some fantastic people who really knew engineering but didn't have those computer skills. We then went out and got graduates, uh, trainees, apprentices, and modern people that come out of school these days they can code. They, they've grown up. They're the swipe generation. And it's so easy to do some of this coding that what we did is we specifically put two engineers that really good time served engineers that didn't understand digital. And then you had some kids who wanted to be engineers, but didn't have the digital, but didn't have the time served element of it. And we put them together on desks. So four to a big round desk. And it just naturally happened. Um, a little bit of encouragement, and then, and then it just happened. Uh, and since then, we've been finding people on the shop floor with digital skills. Because when you start collecting this data, uh, in 2014, when that line went in, we could see on the night shift, on one particular operation, I remember well, it was stage two, we had an uptime of 98%. Same operation on the day shift, had an uptime of 72%. And it was, the, it was controlling, it was the controlling up on the line. So came back on a night shift, asked the, the young operator who was on there. He, he was a Lithuanian uh, that traveled in using uh, free, movement, move, uh, free movement of people. When we were struggling to recruit, willing to work a night shift. Uh, but he was actually 
he had a degree in uh, IT, but we didn't know, and he was able to fix it. Uh, and, and so the data led us to him, and he's now programmed the new JLR line. So you start to get, as you start to get collect data, you start to get more people in and more involved in it, but it does need um, some different skills bringing into your business. And Will, you, you, you mentioned uh, in your talk about bringing in graduates, because that's something you've been doing for a while now at Warren Services, isn't yes. it? Yeah, well, not necessarily graduates. I think probably we, we, bought, we don't employ that many graduates as, because we generally, you know, we've got a lot of degree level apprentices now. Um, but we had a guy called James Tetler who was on a year, who came as a digital catalyst that then stayed for a work placement. But I think one of the most important stories from us is we use um, software robots as well as, you know, cobots and hard robots. So what, what software robots allow you to do is you train them to carry out repetitive tasks within your computer system. So for instance, all of our incoming invoices are dealt with by robots. So invoice comes in by email, the robot opens the email, opens the document, it uses OCR to scan the document, it then opens up our ERP system, checks that item has been booked in. If it gets a perfect match, it then opens up our account system and puts that data into our account system. If it doesn't match, it then says, oh, this hasn't been booked in. It automatically sends that to the goods in department. If it's a price query, it will automatically send it to purchasing. And all that's done with a robot, which was programmed by a person who used to work in the accounts department. So Dawn saw my passion for wanting to deploy these software robots. And she was like, to be honest, Will, don't really like being an accounts person. It's quite boring. But I really like the idea of being a robot programmer. So she, I said, well, let's go for it. What, there's loads of on, we use a system called UiPath. Um, it's free to download. There's loads of online learning. She said, I said, look, you can learn some at work. She said, I'll learn some at home. We sent her to Las Vegas for the like, UiPath World Conference. And now she's deploying these robots within the business doing tasks like we use it for chasing acknowledgements you know when we send a purchase order chasing over dues we use it for taking data out of warren web and putting it into our erp system but she was a good accounts person who was bored whose job was actually going to get automated by some of these robots that she then decided she wanted to be the programmer of those robots so it's like poacher turn gamekeeper you could say sort of thing you know she could see her job being destroyed by a robot, so I want to be in charge of the robot. So it's been it's been great like that, and there's been some, you know, like your guy from the night shift. You discover, you know, that it's that we've got these people in the business. You know, automation, whether it be in the factory or in the office, is going to destroy job roles. But those people can then be de redeployed to to better jobs, like the like the guy never really wanted to be cutting my grass. He wanted to be doing the borders and the trimming the hedges and stuff. So the robots doing the grass and the same, you know, this is, this is going to be the next five, 10, 15 years. And if yep. you haven't got a choice, that's what I think people have got to understand is it's, it's digitized or die. You'll get away with it for another five years, maybe. But after that, the benefits of, digitization automation will be so great that it'll make these companies uncompetitive and they will just go out of business or get snapped up by people like autocraft or you know by us i think one of the big tests for us that i think is really important here is we we started collecting data plus all of the the, the uh, so into spreadsheets we started collecting uh, we already collected for many years sorry the, the the manual records and within six months that went and that went from six people to being a morning one day a week for one person. Now, most of the companies I've worked for in the past would have gone, oh, brilliant. Make it redundant, take it to the bottom line. That will destroy your culture if you go and yeah. take anything like that. So, so we made a real point of making sure that those people had the ability to choose other roles in the business and make sure they were really protected and encouraged to be redeployed and seen to be redeployed into other really good jobs rather than costing jobs. So one of the things that Will uh, said earlier, growth, we've grown, Warren Services have grown. It's much harder to do it in a declining business than a growing business because people will quickly put the barriers up if they think it's costing them another job. Yeah, yeah I think I'd echo that because 
the the Dawn, who is the robot leader now, she's destroyed someone's job role who was dealing with all these in, incoming invoices, which was a fairly low level job. We pay reasonable wages to everyone, but that was the lower end of the tier. That young lady is now training to be an HR professional to support our apprenticeship program. So she's going to start doing a level three CIPD and then hopefully work through that scheme so we can afford to pay her more money. She's going to make the business better because our apprentices are the lifeblood of the future. You know, I need to make sure that I'm 43 now. I need someone that's going to pay my pension when I'm, when I'm 70 on. So I think it's, yeah, like Mike said, it's key that people see that automating these jobs gets them a better job, not the sack. Yeah, absolutely. And cobotics, where robots and humans work together, are perhaps a really, a, a, a really good, a really good uh, example of that. And I know, Mike, something I've heard you talk about before is how the quality improvements that you were able to demonstrate through introducing this technology then also help you diversify the business into into other markets. Um, yes. We've, we've, because we can demonstrate what we've done. We've gone from, uh, as you're making an engine, your, your, your every single piece of data is collected. That's meant that we've been able to go from uh, automotive into aerospace. So we now build small piston engines for light aircraft. And we got the approval for that within nine months from doing nothing in the market to providing uh, all of the engines for the third largest uh, small airplane manufacturer in the world in nine months yeah, uh, so yeah. it, it, it really really helped our, 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 our diversification and frankly it doesn't matter that general capability that we've got if you're assembling an engine a transmission a battery pack it's how it goes together yeah absolutely so just going on the question Sam I think Mike answered your question about how people reacted when cameras were installed as part of that broader question about uh, about culture change. But now uh, we have an anonymous question, um, and this is something that's a really important point that's often raised as a as a barrier. How, how did you find, how costly have you found the security elements of putting data in the cloud? Um, and was that transition easy? It's, it's a, you know, I think it's an overblown thing sometimes. People make it of a bigger thing than it really is you know people are happy to transfer millions of pounds on online banking but they don't want to have their uh, you know their engineering data on there most of the platforms now something like the microsoft platform yeah it's got to be secure you know the levels of security there far outweigh any security you could have physically in your own factory because the whole business is based around securely you know securely holding data same same with google you know it's it's there's always a risk but there's i believe you're more likely to get hacked on premises based servers than you are on cloud servers you know i've i owned another business um until recently that built high pressure firefighting systems for um the custodial sector but also big data centers those data centers where that, that stuff is held are physically amazingly secure, but also digitally very, very, very secure, especially if you choose, you know, to put your stuff on one of the larger vendors platforms like Microsoft, you know, like Amazon, you know, there's, there's or Google, there's, you know, the, the, they are, you, it's something you've got to consider. You can't, you know, because you've got, you've got to consider it, but I think it's a thing that people maybe worry about too much. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, that. That's great. And I wonder whether sometimes that's a a bit of a barrier that people you know put up to sort of give them an excuse not to go down down the journey. I I, I wonder whether that happens sometimes. Um, so really interested. Actually, it's one of the questions. If you fill out our survey, we will we will we will ask you. Um, I I believe if, with the with the security thing as well. I was talking to someone within the um, defence sector and saying. You know, we're now looking to not deploy any physical paper drawings on the shop floor. They'll only be viewable through these 4K screens. Well, obviously, that means we can limit exactly who sees that drawing. No one can take that drawing home. We can see how long they looked at it for, or what, what workstation, were they at the right workstation. It won't allow them to see a drawing they're not meant to do. And if you're working in a mixed environment on defense contracts where you've got to have, you know, British nationals only, you can 
you can you can lock down exactly who can see those documents to specific people. Fair enough, someone could creep up behind you and look at your screen, but if you're not printing that document out, I believe you know that adds to the security. Thank you. I think it's an, an extremely extremely good point. Uh, Will, we have a question next for you from Rob McGrail. Uh, he says he's in a similar boat to you. Did you look at off the shelf products very much? Or did you decide custom built software was was the better route? Yeah, we've got a real mixture. So we we work heavily with Autodesk. So our design software, our vault, our tools like that are from you know out of a box. Our ERP is the same ERP. We use a, a Redthorn ERP system that's for manufacturing on Oracle backend, which is now cloud hosted. But we've then yeah, we found it easier to get what we wanted by We've done some of the development ourselves, but we've also partnered with a local IT company to do our software support that also write, write our cloud platform. So they had a skeleton platform called Sysflow, and we've built our functionality onto that. And literally, like today, I just had a quote through for 600 quid to add some new functionality. So we, we talk as a team, decide what we want to do, get a quote for it, and then ask them to build it. So it's a, it's a real mixture. The robot stuff is developed in-house. Warren Webb is developed externally. And then we use off-the-shelf packages. And we, our mantra is that we want everything to be cloud-based, you know, browser-based, subscription, and have open APIs. So cloud-based so we can deploy it anywhere. Um, subscription, so if we don't like it after a while, we can get rid of it and get something different, and we're not buying it up front. Um, and open APIs just mean that it can connect with our other tools. And you know, we're, we're very strict around what we choose to connect with using those um, selection criteria. That's, that's really helpful. I think you've also probably answered Mike Ayres' question um, also, um, which was the next one on our list. Now, Scott, uh, Scott Morby has asked, uh, Will, um, to what extent would you be willing to share your software robot ideas? Uh, uh, everything and... we're complete we're completely open we we've run a number of events at warren services sharing what we're doing in partner with different partners we have pre-covid we've had visitors into the factory every day we're we're hoping with the robot stuff and with the warren web that that is actually maybe become a digital part of the business that we would actually be able to share that and maybe create some revenue from that in the future the same with the sensor technology that's monitoring the machinery and bringing that data in that we see that as a potential revenue stream you know we started off manually milling and manually turning now we make and design complete electromechanical machines for people around the world why can't we have a digital services part of the business why can't we have a you know a, a sensor part of the business so yeah i'm i'm a charlotte will content i'm very happy to share you know how we've done everything and if people can take that away and use it um in their businesses that makes british manufacturing better you know that's what i want to see i want to see britain survive in, and be better at the back of end of this thank you that's 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 very generous and if people are interested and, and charlotte will uh, sort of give her contact details a bit later then um, get in touch with her and she can she can let you have uh links to the relevant information um i think um, so Dan um, Aldridge made a comment about lean. I think Mike, and you addressed that a bit in your yeah. early question. Was there anything else you wanted to say on that? Uh, we're not a traditional business where lean is can can apply. The, the previous owners have tried lean; it's purest, and we are a high complexity, low volume, high flexibility business. We need whip. We need stock, all the dirty words that the purists of lean. But you, as I say, you take the best bits out of lean. Uh, we kept them about the, the stand-up meetings, the hour by hour working over a problem. Uh, we, we, we've taken that into it. Uh, and the other thing I've seen coming through, uh, just checking down on the, on the, on the questions, uh, I normally have a slide in, which has, actually is a pie chart of where we see what we talk industry for. And uh, Industry 4 isn't robots. And I, know, I, I smiled when at the start of this, when I think 64% robots and cobots. We've got three robots, small robots, and one large robot. One large robot 
um, because it's just too big and heavy for a person to lift. Uh, and the other, the other ones you've just seen are the camera systems built into them for doing the uh, um, sealant application. Where we see the power is the AI and linking it all together. And I think that also helps with the cultural that we spoke about earlier, because it's not a robot coming in and replacing a person. That's always been a fear in British manufacturing or manufacturing around the world for a couple of decades now. You've got to take the best bits and find the natural mix of that for you. Uh, and, and digital, AI, uh, cobots, it's all part of it. So, so Will, what are, what are your thoughts on that, on David Eels's question, which is, is the one at the, at the top of the list now? Um, you've talked about software robots, which is perhaps not what we, always tend, we tend to think about actual, you know, uh, physical robots when we talk about it. But what's been your experience with, uh, with, with robotics? Yeah, so we... <laughs> For those that know about, you know, CNC turning, you don't, with, with bar fed machines, you don't need a robot because the bar gets fed in through a bar feeding robot that's not a really robot and the parts fall out the other end. But we are actually, funny enough, at the moment, commissioning a new cobot on one of our milling machines at the moment. And actually, all the guys within that cell and that, those, ro those robot stroke cobots will then get rolled out as much as possible because they see it as a just someone to help them you know they don't really want to be loading 500 parts in a machine you know we will definitely as much as our deployment of software and digital the the the, the cobots are coming and they're you know they are going to be a powerful force within british manufacturing over the next five years there's a real you know we're we've actually done all of the development of the cell all the plc stuff all the um connection with the machines because we actually see that as a possible um product for us moving forward so we look to we've been looking to deploy these cobots within the in the factory but then also look to do that as a product moving forward so like all of these things if you're if you're at the front of it and you can show it in real life in your factory it's obviously a lot easier to sell to other people but i definitely are very very much on board with the with the whole deployment of cobots into particularly the milling and welding environment uh, we're starting to integrate the cobots with the uh, cameras. So that's one of our projects at the moment for the next 12 months, taking not just the sealant, but actually doing some of the tools, so the, the repetitive tasks that the, uh, the operators, the, the staff don't particularly like to, like to do. Uh, the other thing about robots is, though, they are far easier to justify in a CapEx form compared with AI and some of the other industry digital stuff. It's an easy thing to do, say, you take that job out, you put a robot in, you used to pay that person X thousand a year, so many shifts, you got your payback calculation. Yeah. Uh, so it ticks a lot of boxes for companies that really are rigorously need that, um, that aren't willing to take a punt and must have a calculation uh, on a capital form. I think also the camera thing is very important. We're using... We're using vision to pick up the billets to go into the machine. So rather than having to make racks to put the parts in exactly the right place, we can just yep. chuck the parts down on a on a loading table. The robot sees where the part is. Only in 2D what we're doing. It's not 3D bin picking, but literally the operator just has to lay the parts out. The robot can see the part, pick the part up and put the part in the machine. So then it's obviously a lot quicker to deploy to different jobs rather than having to make fixture in to know the, the, the known location. I think it's also about making the robot easy to take on and off. So if you need to do, sometimes we're making, you know, low volume as in i.e. one part, you know, that's not, that doesn't work for the robot. So to get the sort of cell managers on board, they want to go, well, I want it there, but then I want to be able to take it away. So it's that, that ease of swapping between automated and manual is very important within our low volume business. Thank you. I mean, there were lots of lots of great questions there. I think we've probably just got time for one more before we uh, go to our final poll and conclusions. And I'm just going to pick Mark Wood's question, the last one on the list, because I think that is that that's 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 a really important one. So Mark saying, "Is being clear on your strategy, the end game, um, uh, is has that been your experience, Mike, or did you just kind of start and see see where you went?" Sorry, just repeat that again. I, I so just cut Mark, out. Mark is saying, is being clear on your strategy, uh, the end game, the key ingredient, thereby avoiding implementation for implementation's sake? 
Um, for us, we weren't really prescriptive over where we want, what wanted to be. We just knew it would enable us to get somewhere that was uh, And you've got to allow people to play and experiment a little bit um, and, and see where it ends up. You can't be too prescriptive. We have an overall strategy, but we usually have lots of pillars. Um, and so long as you make progress on a certain level on those pillars, then the, the strategy, the, the, you, you go where you want to go. Um, so it's not, it's not, don't, don't stifle the innovation by being too prescriptive. Yeah, I would agree totally. Don't try and find the end of the journey because the end of the journey is never going to be that. It's going to be a journey forever. And you trying to sit around working out a perfect strategy, you want to start doing something quick tomorrow in the next week. And then everyone in the business contribute to where the business is going. And actually in my type of business, I don't necessarily know where the business is going to be in six months time. You know, I've got, we've got a strategy, but we, we have to, you know, who knew COVID was going to come along? Who knew that my theatre side of the business was going to be destroyed? Who knew the uptake of electric vehicles would accelerate? Well, hopefully I, you know, I did hope that would happen, but you know, you've got to, you've got to try things and see what has benefit in the business and let, everyone contribute to to making the system better rather than you know we're going to rigidly march down this track and you know this is the way we're going to go i think you've got to uh, you've got to allow it to happen as you go along but with with the idea that you know you you're you're making steps towards being more digital more cloud based more connected more able to share you know is 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 i think you know is is the key yeah, and don't be afraid to fail. Do not criticise people for failing. It's it's the, the cultural part of it's more important than the than the the, the the fine detail of the strategy. Yeah, and be be quick to realise you failed. I think as well. Yeah, where I has to fail. Don't don't keep don't keep pushing on when if you if you stuck ten grand into something and then it doesn't end up working, you're like you'll probably but you will have learned. You will have got value from that. But don't go, oh, we've got to keep flogging a dead horse because you're better off to push that to the side and say, I've learned a lesson there and, you know, carry on with something else. Don't, yeah, don't, they, they use the term fail fast, but it's, it's, I think it's hard for engineers, but like Mike or like me, you know, the thing can't be wrong. When you make an engine, when I make a winch that flies someone, it can't be wrong. It's got to be exactly right. But when you're developing digital tools, you can afford to play a bit fast and loose sometimes and just have a go. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Mike. And that great, great advice just to end with there. Um, well, thank you uh, for all your great questions. Sorry, you didn't have time to answer quite all of them, but we got through most of them. So just before we wrap up, I'd just be interested in your thoughts um, on, for the participants, that is, um, on what you think, um, based maybe on what you knew already, but also what you've heard from our discussion today about what you think your digital future looks like. So uh, hopefully you can see the poll on the screen now. And we're asking three questions. Firstly, do you think the COVID crisis and the emphasis on resilience that you've heard us talk about today, has that actually improved the case for investing in technology in your business? Uh, do you think your business has got the skills and knowledge needed to get the most out of new technology? That's something that both Will and Mike have talked about and, and you've asked, asked questions about. And then finally, around advice and support, do you think you know where to go to find help um, to, to help you along your digital journey? Um, and if the answer to any of these questions is no, don't worry, we are here to help you and I'll, I'll explain how in just a moment. Tim, while people are filling that out, obviously I'm happy for you to share my contact details if anyone's got any questions directly to me um i'm happy to share but on the proviso that i will be asking them if they've got apprentices and if they haven't got apprentices they're gonna have to listen to us tell them about apprentices as well <laughs> <laughs> you know, a warren rule you know if you, you're gonna have to justify why you haven't got an apprentice and then i'll tell you everything you need to know but you've got to tell me you're gonna have an apprentice <laughs> absolutely thank you will that's 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 very generous um, would anybody else uh, like to like to vote on that? Does 
Okay, just if you just like to vote now, if you've not voted, and I'll close the poll in just a moment. Um, it's about, it's got about two thirds of people have voted. Right, so I'm going to close the poll now. And then let's just share the results. So that's very interesting. And then, you know, that first, let's capture that first one. And that is, that's really good to see. Uh, uh, only one person who voted, only uh, that's 4% in percentage terms, thought that the crisis hasn't improved the case for investing in technology. 96% of you thought it, thought, it, thought it has. I think that's a really, really interesting result. And I think shows um, why this focus on resilience is more important. 50-50 split on do you think you've got the skills and knowledge needed to get the most out of new technology? Very interesting. And then 75% uh, of you feel you do know where to get advice and support. That's really, really good to see, but 25% of you don't. And um, that's something I'll talk about in a minute where we, where we want to continue working with you to, to improve things. So thank you very much. Nina, have you got all of that? Okay. Great. So I'm just going to share with you one last slide and then we will uh, wrap it up. Not that one, this one. So thank you very much everyone for participating today. Um, I think a few, you've heard, you've heard a lot of takeaways and thank you for your great questions. Um, we will be sending out a uh, follow up um, explaining also where support's available if you're the 25% of people who voted saying that you weren't sure where to where to go and uh, find it. But um, there are a few things where we'd be very grateful for your help to help us to help you. Um, firstly, please do complete our Innovation Monitor survey, regardless of where you are on your digital journey. We'd really like to hear from you and uh, get that get that information and the better data we have the better we're able to devise services and ideas and policy to help you. Um, do work with your own regional partners to help make sure they see this agenda uh, as a priority and they make the help and support available uh, that we all need and do keep your own examples of best practice coming. Um, and uh, it's great to see so many of you from across the Midlands and East on this call. And um, please do keep connected with our regional team, Charlotte and Chris, both of whom have been on the panel throughout this. And just to close uh, with a bit of follow up, I'm just going to hand you over to Charlotte. Charlotte. Super, Tim. Thank you. You might just want to stop sharing your slides because I think we are struggling a little bit on bandwidth, but um, it goes without saying a, a big thank you to the Make UK team who have made uh, today happen, but a massive thank you to two chaps um, who I've worked with for a number of years now, Mike and, and Will, um, and it's an absolute reassurance as to why the team at Make UK do what we do. Um, it's just so um, empowering and in exciting to hear the kinds of activities that you guys are, are working through even during a pandemic, and I do hope that we've at least uh, turned some of the 19% that didn't think that um, digital manufacturers were resilient manufacturers. I hope today's objective has been to perhaps win some of those hearts and minds um, back around. As Tim said, we'll be sending out some more information that will help you uh, be signposted to the support agencies, the funds, the networks um, that operate across the Midlands and the East, but also nationally. Um, you'll have our contact details on there. Um, a big plug from us right now, manufacturing, I think we've reawakened um, with a new rock and roll. We've um, you know, put a spotlight back on the sector. And if I could ask you to do one more thing, um, apart from take on an apprentice to please Mr. Bridgman, it would be to consider entering our awards, which do close on the 3rd of July. Um, I know people are, are stretched for time right now, but for us, we don't think that there's been a more important time to champion the sector. We've got a special award for people that have made some major efforts working through uh, COVID-19. Um, today's audience, I think you, many of you will be primed for entering our innovation award, but please can I ask you, do you get behind UK manufacturing as Will has passionately spoken about? And I know Mike is absolutely behind. Uh, the Make UK team is here to help, but thank you today um, for the team that have made it happen and our two guest speakers, and of course, a great audience crossing uh, the middle band of England. So thank you all and have a safe rest of the day.